good morning or good afternoon. And um, I'd like to start by just saying what we'll be talking about today are ways to clone DNAs that are particularly problematic. Um, and we'll start off with just just talking a little bit about the, the agenda. So we'll first go through what makes DNA difficult to clone or express. Um, we'll also show some circular vectors that we have to address some of these problems. We'll talk about some linear vectors for the very difficult DNAs. And then um, we'll go through some enzyme-free cloning tricks that are make things very easy to clone in some cases. And finally, we'll talk about a couple of E. coli strains that are useful for cloning either toxic proteins or unstable DNAs. So first of all, what is unclonable DNA? There are several characteristic types of DNA that are typically problematic for people. Um, first is toxic coding sequences. Of course, if your DNA is making something that kills your bacteria that you're trying to clone it into, you're not going to get it too easily. Um, promoters can be tough. They interfere with um, the functions of the vector. AT-rich DNA is a very common problem that our customers talk to us about, and we have methods to handle that very well. Large fragments are can be difficult, um, depending upon the length and the uh, AT content of those. And trace amounts of DNA are always tough to clone. And we won't be talking too much about that, but um, suffice it to say that everything that can clone the um, difficult DNAs also work well with the trace amounts. It, um, this depends mostly on the, uh, the quality of the vector prep. So uh, I'll give this one over to, to Rob. Um, all right. Well, everybody's answering already. Go for it. Um, so this, is, this question is, which type of difficult DNA are you having to work with in the lab right now, or what have you worked with in the past? Um, just out of curiosity's sake, we'll take a few seconds here. Hopefully everyone can see the results as they're going. Uh, toxic genes look like they're number one. Repetitive sequences, they're leading. Oh, keeps flipping back and forth. OK, keep going. Toxic genes. In my past life, when I worked on uh, respiratory syncytial virus, uh, I was a virologist. I had terrible time dealing with the envelope proteins of RSV. They were very toxic at E. coli. I wish I had had these vectors when I was in the lab that Ron's going to talk about. So, all right. So I guess looks like every oh, it's kind of evening out. All right. Um, let's give everybody just a few seconds more, and uh, then we'll call it quits. But okay. So it looks like uh, the winner is uh, toxic genes. Oh no, the winner is large fragments now. Interesting, interesting. So it looks pretty well spread across the across the board, except for AT Rich. AT Rich was the loser here. So thank you for that information. I hope everybody found that useful. It's kind of cool uh, information to uh, get out of the, this poll. So um, take it away, Ron. OK, so um, interesting that not many people had problems with AT Rich DNA. Um, we've actually had quite a few customers contact us about not being able to clone that. So um, I will talk a lot about AT Rich DNA, but also repetitive sequences, GC Rich, and toxic genes are, uh, are in, the, in the talk here. So um, it turns out that a lot of the problems that you experience with, with these DNAs are not necessarily the DNA itself, but the, the features of common cloning vectors. So these features help with traditional, easy to clone DNAs, but they can cause serious problems with certain other DNAs. So um, one major problem is vector-driven transcription into the insert, uh, particularly, particularly if you're using a, a blue-white screening vector like PUC19. You have a strong LAC promoter driving transcription into your insert. Um, and then you have the lac -Z peptide at the end, which hopefully would not be expressed if you have a properly cloned gene. So the trouble with vector-driven transcription is that uh, if you have a toxic insert, of course, it's going to be transcribed. And if the uh, translation signals are there, you're going to produce a toxic protein. And I'm sure many of you have experienced that. Um, also, if you have uh, certain secondary structures of your DNA, um, transcription can make that uh, difficult to clone. Um, this is more of a problem with repetitive DNA, or sometimes with AT-rich DNA as well. Um, transcription of the AT-rich DNA can, uh, pre can create a, a transcript which forms a triple helix structure with your insert, which can cause problems in stability. But in addition, you have uh, transcription from your insert being driven into your vector. 
And um, in some cases, if you have transcription going into the LAC C alpha peptide, you will get a blue colony, and you will imagine that that's a, a, a negative. But in, in reality, you could have LAC C just being expressed from a promoter in your insert. And a lot of things act like promoters, even though you don't expect them to. So you wind up with blue colonies that actually do have an insert. Um, but in, in addition to this, transcripts going either way can interfere with either the origin of replication or with the drug resistance expression. So um, just, just the fact of having a promoter and no gene at all being cloned can cause the plasmid to be non-viable. PUC19, uh, as everyone knows, has a very high copy number. And that just sort of amplifies all the other issues that you may see. Anything that's difficult to clone at single copy is even harder to clone at multiple copies. And finally, um, PUC19 and similar vectors are supercoiled. And if you have a DNA with repetitive regions or um, just long tracts of a single type of base, um, poly A tract, for example, the, the supercoiling can cause those structures to, to pop out of the plasmid um, and, and be removed by recombinases and, and similar enzymes. So you wind up um, just a supercoiling itself causes parts of your insert to be deleted. So what to do about these sorts of problems? Um, what we've come up with is a, um, a minimized version of PUC that's designed to address all of these issues. First of all, the insert is transcriptionally isolated from the rest of the vector. So we have a terminator on either side of the insert to prevent the insert from transcribing into the vector. We also have terminators after the uh, the drug resistance gene that will stop any transcription from the from the drug resistance gene going around the vector, and also um, these these terminators will stop any spurious transcription from the vector from going into the insert. Um, so also you'll notice we don't have the LAXE promoter and LAXE peptide at the cloning site. So the, uh, the the advantage of this is you don't have the vector driven transcription into your insert. So uh, a problem you may be thinking is, well, how do you know what has your insert and what doesn't? Um, the, the key is to do a very good vector prep. So we do the vector prep here at Lucigen and provide it to customers that way. So the, the vector prep is done such that there's virtually zero background. So any clone you get will have an insert. Um, <clears throat> so, so you just simply don't need the LAC-Z LAC marker anymore. Then we have uh, several different versions of this vector, either AMP or CAN resistance, or high or low copy number. And to achieve a lower copy number, we have a, uh, some versions of the vector have the uh, ROP gene, repressor of primer, which um, represses the, the origin of replication to give you more of a um, PBR type copy number, just a, um, a, a, a low copy, approximately 10 to 15 copies per cell. So um, th th this is just a couple examples that we started out with to see how well this technology really worked for us. The first gene we tried to clone was an RNase gene. Um, this was very toxic in, in traditional vectors. So um, we got it cloned into PSMART vectors with no problem. Either orientation worked just fine. But in PUC19, we found that if it was in the sense orientation relative to LAXE promoter, um, that promoter would express the RNAs gene, and we would never get any colonies. If the insert was in backwards, in the backwards orientation, we would get only antisense RNA made, and it was possible to clone the gene in that, in that case. Another difficult little insert that we did was simply just a lambda PR promoter, um, small fragment, 400 bases. In a PSMART vector, we just randomly picked colonies, and 3 quarters of them had the promoter the promoter fragment um, intact and in either orientation. Um, in contrast with PUC19, only about a fourth of the colonies that we picked, these, these were white colonies, only about a fourth of the white colonies actually had the promoter fragment. If we screened some of the blue colonies, we could in fact see that the fragment was there, but um, because it was a promoter, it was driving the lax -E peptide, and we just never would have thought that that was a positive, a positive result. So, so again, showing the uh, transcriptional isolation is important for cloning these types of inserts. Um, also, you can have cDNAs that you wouldn't expect necessarily to be toxic, but the cells just simply don't like to make them. 
Um, this is some uh, data from a collaborator of ours, Doug Crawford. Um, they, they made a um, cDNA library in either PSMART or in PUC19. And after they had the library, they picked clones, isolated the clones, and then um, they would need to go back and regrow these clones to, to make more DNA. And what, what they found was that if they took cultures, or stock cultures of each of the clones, and regrew them in liquid media, diluted, and regrew again, they found that um, deletion rates were, were pretty, pretty high for PUC19. So the, the blue bars here show the percent of clones that were deleted from the PUC19 libraries. And um, it's more common with the, the higher insert sizes. Um, it's, it's kind of a, unusual that it dropped off a little bit with the very high inserts. But, but the point is that they, they saw a lot of deletions across the whole spectrum of insert sizes. Um, and again, in the, in the PSMART vector with the cDNA libraries, the clones were, were pretty much stable across the board. So you pick your library, grow a clone. Um, regrow them, make stocks, and grow them again, and they just seem to stay exactly what they were to start with. So um, moving on to, to just structural problems here, um, AT-rich fragments, as, as I mentioned, have uh, traditionally um, they've been a problematic target. We, we've had quite a few customers uh, complain about not being able to make AT-rich, uh, not be able to clone AT-rich genomes. In this case, um, Lactobacillus helveticus was the target DNA that, that we were trying to clone. And I'm making a library of just relatively small 2 to 4 KB, KB inserts in PUC19 gave a, a, a pretty miserable library. Um, uh, there were a few clones that were apparently stable and correct, but uh, a large proportion of the clones were, were empty. And this was with a good vector prep. We, we did our best to, to prep this vector, but still wound up with a lot of clones that apparently were empty just by looking at them uncut, looking at uncut mini prep DNA on a gel. Putting the same DNA prep into a PSMART library, high copy library, we found that we got a, got a real good sized library. But um, much to our dismay at the time, we found that about half the clones suffered some sorts of deletions in the high copy version of PSMART. And that is what originally led us to try a low copy version of the plasmid. And what we found that the number, the number of uh, stable clones was improved. Um, but more importantly to us, the number of unstable clones just dropped right off. So, um, so overall, we had fewer clones in the library. But the clones we did get were, were intact and stable. And this is shown on the next slide, just uh, some of the clones from the libraries. So um, the red line marks the size of the, uh, the uncut vector, the, the parental vector. And um, with the PSMART library, you can see all the clones are this 2 to 4 KB insert size that we expected. With the PUC19 library, the, uh, the vector line is again, the vector size is again marked with the red line. And while there were clones that were the expected size, 2 to 4 KB larger than the vector, um, surprisingly, there were quite a few clones that were even smaller than the vector. So not only was the insert DNA lost from these clones, but a, a chunk of the vector was taken away with it. So th this was our first dramatic evidence that the, uh, the, the AT-rich DNA was just very unstable when it was in a puck type vector. But we found that the same vector works real well just for cloning larger fragments. And this is just 50% GC, so nothing structurally anomalous about this DNA that, that we expected. And we, we found we just got real nice libraries of um, 8, to, 8 to 12 or 14 KB inserts using a low copy vector without any transcriptional um, interference between vector and insert. Um, for those of you who need even bigger inserts, it helps to go to a lower copy number vector. So what we came up with was just using a back vector to clone inserts that were not necessarily backs. So in this case, we, we started with a, a traditional back backbone, um, bacterial artificial chromosome, for those of you who are not familiar with the term back. 
Um, th this is, has all the traditional parts of a back vector, but again, we trimmed it down so it's the, as small a size as could be. We oriented it so that the vector was transcribing away from the insert, put the terminators in there to keep the insert and the vector from fighting each other. And um, we have a LACZ and SACB stuffer fragment that um, is removed during processing here at Lucigen so that what you would get is just an empty vector ready to clone. So um, th this makes things, again, very, very easy to, to work with. So if there is any um, background of empty vector that would uh, slip through the prep, again, it, it's, it's a very low number, but any that does slip through will have a, a, a LACZ gene, so it will be blue on your plate. And there's also a SACB gene, which creates a toxic product in the presence of um, sucrose. So um, if you plate on plates that have uh, XGAL and sucrose in them, um, you won't see any vector background at all. So um, the nice thing about cloning in a vector like this is it's single copy when you're cloning. So um, toxic, toxic inserts, either, uh, either because of their coding sequence, their product, or the structural problems, um, are maintained at a very low copy number, so no chance of recombination between vectors, um, not much of any toxic product being made by the cell. So the, the cells much prefer to, to, to keep top toxic inserts in a single copy vector like this. Um, so that's during the cloning step. In the presence of arabinose, the host cells have the uh, TRFA gene, which is a, um, a um, <clears throat> replication protein which works on the origin or EV here. And that will bump up the copy number from single copy up to 20 to 50 copies per cell, depending on the, the nature of the insert and the size of the insert. And, and again, uh, blue-white screening is not necessary. We, we deliberately took it away to improve stability of inserts in this vector. And uh, that, that increased stability is shown on the next slide here. So cloning um, tetrahymena DNA into this vector um, went, went very well. These, these, again, are just randomly picked colonies as they were in the previous gels. And um, we, we were trying to get 10 to 20 KB fragments of this DNA into the vector. And prior to this, this DNA from, from tetrahymena had never been clonable. Um, you, people were able to get small inserts cloned for KB, maybe it was about the top of the top of the size range. But cloning 10 to 20 KB of tetrahymena has just had just not been possible prior to using this vector. Um, and so with the PSMART vector, we saw a very nice library of inserts. Um, nice size of the, the marker here, 10 KB is the upper band. So all 10 KB and greater. Put in same DNA into a traditional blue-white back vector. Um, we, we found that, again, this DNA was very, very susceptible to deletion. So we got sizes all over the board, but mostly small. So, so this, again, speaks to the difficulty of cloning on AT-rich DNA in this, type, in, in this common type of vector with, with LACZ promoters. So that brings us to the... Um, the big easy cloning system. Um, what we found that um, some DNAs still were not even clonable in the back type vectors, um, at least not, not in a stable way. So we came up with a system where we would make a linear vector to clone DNA, which would remove all the supercoiling issues. So um, the this, this system is referred to as the big easy cloning system, and the vector that's in the system is the PJAS linear vector. So I'll be using these terms sort of interchangeably, big easy and PJAS. So here's a picture of what the vector looks like. It is um, derived from a linear phage of E. coli called N15. So we, we kept the replication parts of the phage and got rid of all the structural and infection elements. So you wind up with two cloning arms, uh, a large left arm and a smaller right arm, with the insert DNA uh, cloned between it. So because it's linear, you don't have supercoiling, which you obviously will get with a, super, with a, uh, a circular vector. During its replication, which I'll show in the next slide, there's no circular intermediate formed at any time. So it's always a linear molecule. Um, again, we put the transcriptional terminators into the vector to, to um, prevent any transcriptional interference between insert and vector. And the vector 
genes are again designed to be transcribed away from the insert. We found that there's very little size bias with this vector, partly because it can easily maintain fragments of any size, but also when you do a ligation with this type of vector, the ligation of one side of the insert is independent from ligation at the other side of the insert. So whether you're cloning a 1 kb insert or a 40 kb insert, you have two independent ligation reactions going on. So the size really does not matter as far as um, the amount, of, or as far as the ability to, to, to get in, an insert into the DNA. Uh, and finally, we have two different versions of the vector, either chloramphenicol resistance or canamycin resistant. And I should um, mention that I, I'm talking about ligation here quite a bit, but this sort of vector also works very well for Gibson-type cloning. So um, just a, bit, a picture of the replication of the vector. Um, I think I went too far here. So um, the vector is starts out as a linear molecule after you do your, your, your ligation or Gibson cloning into the vector arms. When it's in the cell for replication, uh, there is a um, vector, pro, vector encoded protein, REP-A, which initiates replication within an origin in the, in the left arm of the vector. The cellular polymerase go, goes ahead and transcribes around the corner here and back down the other way. And um, th this telomere of the vector is just simply a six-base pair hairpin turn. So you wind up with a double-stranded DNA, which used to be single-stranded. And when that double-stranded DNA is formed, it is recognized as a substrate for another phage or vector-encoded protein called TEL-N. That sees this, this newly formed double-stranded region and simply clips it and then reseals the 5' prime and 3' prime ends of each strand, which recreates the hairpin at either end. And then um, as transcription or, or as replication goes along the vector, the same things happens at the other end. And that's, again, clipped by TEL-N. And you wind up with two linear molecules. Um, REP-A is encoded by the plasmid itself. And TEL-N is provided as a gene on the, uh, the bacterial chromosome of the host cell. So, so again, um, I'd like to stress that even though this is a linear vector, you can use standard ligation methods for cloning or Gibson assembly. Um, we use standard electroporation methods. Turns out that uh, with, with vectors of this size, uh, chemical competent um, cells just are not efficient enough. So, so you, you need to use electroporation, not heat shock transformation. And um, the, the good news for, for anyone using it is that standard alkaline lysis preps work just fine. Um, there, there are some people who are concerned that you need supercoiled plasmid to do an alkaline lysis prep, but um, this, this vector works just fine with any chiogen or zymo research or column-based mini prep method or maxi prep, or however you'd like to do it. So standard methods work just, just great with this vector. So here's an example of what we can do with it. I have several examples, um, actually. So first of all, we went back to this lactobacillus helveticus DNA. Um, uh, as you recall, um, 2 to 4 kb inserts were unstable in PUC19. As I, as I mentioned before, um, this is the vector size. And we just randomly picked clones, showed quite a few were smaller than the vector with PUC19. With the PJAS vector, we were trying to clone up to 10 to 20 kb inserts. And these inserts were excised from the vector when we, when we ran this gel, it's not one digest. And you can see one vector arm here, this is the, the longer left arm. Uh, the, the right arm was run off the gel here, it was just 2 kb. Um, but we saw quite a nice library made here, 10 to 20 kb inserts were cloned with no problem at all. And similarly, um, we were able to clone fragments as high as 20 to 40 kb for tetrahymena. And for, for the nematode, we were searching more for 30 to 40 kb. So, so again, huge inserts, um, traditionally very difficult fragments to clone, uh, no problem at all in the, in the PJAS vector. And um, this is just a quote from a, a, a client of ours who was working with us on this, uh, that uh, this was the first time they were ever, ever able to clone anything like this with, with a difficult genome. Um, similar results were, were obtained from Sanger. 
So in the previous gel, I showed you just a uh, just a subset of of clones that were obtained from the library. Um, what Sanger was doing was trying to clone the entire plasmodium genome into a vector that's derived from PJAS. And they have turned this the PJAS vector into a plasmodium E. coli shuttle vector. So um, it was important for them to clone the entire genome of plasmodium into the vector. And what you can see was that they were very successful in doing that. Um, the dark line shows the number, the pr number of genes cloned according to the expected um, random coverage. And the, the library that they got was very close to what, what was expected from just, just random cloning. So it shows there was very, very little bias at all evident in the library. And this, this library is, is part of their um, PlasmoGem project. And for, for people working on Plasmodium, these, these clones are freely available from the Sanger. So again, this, this stresses that um, re regardless of the type of DNA you're cloning, either the, the structure or the gene involved, um, it, it was cloned very easily into the PJAS vector. So um, for those of you who are, talk, who, are, who are interested in repeats or GC-rich DNA, uh, this example is very relevant. So we were trying to clone the fragile X repeat segment uh, from, from the human genome. Um, this, this fragment, the GCC300, was a synthetically created segment of DNA. But it was pretty much impossible to clone in any type of circular vector. Um, we, we tried it in Puck 19, and we were expecting an insert up here at about 1 kb. But all we got were uh, just, just some, some really short really short clones, very non-homogeneous non uh, preps. So, so there's a lot of deletion was going on even as we tried to grow up the clones. Um, in PJAS, the, the, these are randomly picked colonies. So four out of the six looked pretty much perfect. Um, there were a couple of clones we picked that had either a small insert or possibly no insert at all. Um, but given the difficulty of cloning this, this region, we were quite pleased to see that we got several clones that were correct. And um, through deliberately trying to induce stability, we, we saw that they, stability was um, just, just rock solid. We would grow these clones up into a one liter culture, take a mill out, grow it up to a liter, take a mill out, grow it up to a liter. And throughout those sorts of repetitive subculturing, we found that the clone stays exactly the same. So we never saw deletion um, be becoming a, a problem. A uh, similar type of repetitive DNA was what was seen in a, a mollusk cDNA library that we were asked to create by a, by a client of ours. Um, this was just a 1 to 2 kb library of cDNA. We had no idea what type of DNA it was other than uh, very difficult to clone. Well, we originally tried to clone this fragment into one of our PSMART vectors. And uh, it turned out the largest insert we got was eight base pairs. Um, we just got nothing from a circular vector. Um, turns out in PJAS, the, the library just gave us a, uh, a full set of clones. We didn't have any problems finding any inserts in them. And when we started sequencing these clones, we found that the, the reason that they were so difficult to clone in a stable form apparently was because they're just very repetitive genes. And th these are just the sort of the typical thing we saw, either um, you know, four base pair repeats or five or six base pair just very similar sort of structure here, or here's a, a long stretch of just dinucleotide repeats. So um, in, in any sort of circular vector, this DNA was lost immediately. We just couldn't see any trace of it in the cells. But again, in the PJAS vector, um, these, these clones were just completely stable. And uh, another case of repetitive DNA being cloned in this system was, was done by a collaborator of ours, uh, McFarland, down in Florida. And um, here they're trying to clone SCA10 genomic repeats from humans. And uh, these are a couple of the biggest repeats that they were able to clone. These are four KB inserts. And each little box here represents a repetitive element. And uh, the type of element is shown here. So most of them were the ATTCT element that they were expecting to see. Um, but they found that there are also several other types of repeats in these expanded regions. So, so um, this was the first time they were able to clone this type of insert. And um, they could only tell they had this sort of insert because they were able to do pack biosequencing to read straight through the, 
through the whole region. So um, again, uh, just a, a very strong example of the utility of using the PJAS system for cloning repetitive DNA. So um, a, another way where this vector is very useful is making operons for expression. In this case, we had an op a bacterial operon where we had a, a ribosome binding site in front of each of eight separate genes. And these were all cloned into one large insert into PJAS with a uh, promoter cloned in the front of it. And um, the final product of this, this operon was, was isoprene. And what we found that if you clone all of these genes onto a single vector, the expression was about tenfold higher than having multiple circular vectors with just subsets of the genes all cloned into them. We were not able to get a circular clone that had the whole 10 kb insert in it. Um, it was um, these are all E. coli genes, and it seemed that having all of them together on a circular clone wound up with a, a lot of deletion going on. And even in this clone, we wound up having an insertion element inserted into one of the genes, um, but that didn't destroy the, the activity. Just uh, probably lowered our expression. But um, take-home lesson was that. Making operons in PJAS is easy to do and, in this case, was quite beneficial for expression. So we, we have this version of the vector with the, with the Ramnos promoter um, in-house, and we do provide it by custom quote, but it's not a catalog item. So just a summary of PJAS, whether you're looking at AT-rich or GC-rich, um, both types of DNA seem to be, be maintained very well. Again, that GCC repetitive DNA was 100% GC over a KB. So highly repetitive DNA, not a problem. Large fragments up to 40 KB are cloned quite easily. Um, it's possible that you could go higher than 40 KB. We have just not had a reason to do it. Um, <clears throat> cloning multiple genes is, is quite quite easy. And it maintains very large inverted or tandem repeats. And I'll actually have a little bit more to show you as far as cloning large tandem repeats for expression in, in the later slide. So overall then, for basically any type of insert you need to clone, using this transcription-free or linear vector um, give, gives you a way to clone it. So the clone-smart vectors are they're, they're the go-to vectors for any traditional small type cloning. Whether you know it's difficult or not, um, our attitude is don't take a chance. So the clone smart vectors are easy to work with um, just for, for, for straightforward cloning. It's the first thing I always go to is uh, trying to clone smart, particularly the low copy canamycin resistant vector is always my favorite. I prefer canamycin strongly to, to uh, ampicillin or, um, or carbenicillin because it is, is not metabolized by the cell. So. Um, if things don't work in the clone smart vector, then um, I, I generally move up to the big easy vector. So I've almost never had an insert that couldn't be cloned in big easy. And the copyright vector, I would generally recommend this for anyone who's cloning either BAX or Phosmid type inserts. So 40 KB up to 200 KB is where I go with, with, with copyright. And again, the, the vectors are all provided pre-cut, dephosphorylated, ready for cloning. So it makes things just very simple to basically take your fragment and, and run with it. Um, less than 1% background in the vector preps, so screening is not an issue. And cloning problems are basically removed in most cases by using these vectors. So, um, this brings us to our Expresso series of vectors. Um, these are designed for very quick and easy type, easy cloning. So we'll go back over to, to, to Rob for another poll on methods that people might like for cloning. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Um, let's get to the second question. I should let you know that um, you are welcome to choose more than one answer. So here's the poll, basically, which cloning methods are you currently using? There's a lot of them out there. We tried to capture most. Um, feel free to select as many as, as you use. 
Topo. Standard cloning leading the way. We have an Espresso user, yay. Not many folks use it in Gateway, that's interesting. Okay, cool. Let's give it a few more minutes, a few more seconds here. Yeah, everybody's still, it's interesting, everybody's still using good old restriction digest ligation based cloning. So, with uh, Topo uh, coming in strong second. Awesome, all right, well, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll close that one out. Thanks for your information. Uh, it's very interesting to see that everybody's still um, using sort of the, the the standard methods. Before you take the uh, the slide away, well, it, oh. it's gone. Um, no, I should I mention that I, I should mention that um, most or many of our vectors are designed for restriction type cloning. Um, so, so they're provided as blunt vectors, and um, a lot of users are very hesitant to do blunt cloning. Um, it, it is generally about 20 fold less efficient than sticky end cloning. But again, if you have a good vector prep like the ones we, we provide, blunt end cloning is very straightforward. We do a two hour ligation and a transformation. And we, we never see a problem with, with small, small libraries. In fact, we've cloned as low as five nanograms of insert into the blunt vector and got thousands of clones. So. Um, so, so yeah, I will stress that our vectors are most often provided blunt. Some of them have have sticky ends, but um, blunt cloning is nothing to be afraid of. And actually, our blunt cloning was pretty much the same as a traditional. The, the efficiency was about the same as TA cloning, not quite as efficient as topo cloning, but um, but but again, it works quite well. So you can go ahead and take the chart away, Rob. So, so moving right along then, what we found out is that there is a, a very easy method of cloning that the, the cells provide for us. So um, what, what you can do is simply make your PCR product with slightly longer primers that give you as small as an 18 base overlap between your insert and your vector. So you simply just take 18 bases of vector sequence, put it on the end of your insert. And then you can just simply take your PCR product, mix it with the pre-cut vector, put it directly into cells, and transform. So no processing at all. Just simply mix your PCR product and the vector and immediately transform. So I have a hard time uh, really explaining the simplicity of, or simplicity of this. And when I first saw this, I didn't believe it would ever work. Um, took me months of watching the person next to me do it before I finally got the courage to try it myself. And uh, it, it actually is, and it's amazing. Um, you just get, um, you don't get quite as many colonies as you would with a ligation or topo type cloning. Um, but the important thing is that the colonies you do get are almost always correct. So you, the, the cells, even the Rec A minus cells, have the ability to recombine these ends when you, when you transform them. So um, it's seamless cloning. You, you can't there's no no scar from multiple cloning sites or anything at the at the inserts. You can clone basically any two types of genes together this way. It's directional, no cloning artifacts, no scars. Um, by efficient, um, what we mean is that over 90% of the clones you pick will have the correct insert and the correct junctions, correct orientation. So generally, you only need to pick two colonies to, to get what you need. And um, we have a variety of vectors designed with uh, various tags at the end for solubility or, or a couple of different promoters. So, so using these vector preps, um, you, you can just get very quick and easy, um, li well, not ligation, but insertion of your, your insert into the vector. But it does depend on having a very good vector prep again, because um, there, there's not, a, generally not a, a lot of clones. You can expect a few dozen clones in general from one of these reactions. But we, we found you usually don't need more than two clones to get the correct product. The correct product. So um, just, just an example of what the vector looks like. So again, they're, they're based on the P-SMART vector, um, terminators insulating the insert from the vector. 
And we we provide the vector pre-cut, so there'll be a promoter driving a, a ribosome binding site, and the ATG is already there in the vector. And then we have um, his tags and a terminator following it. And if you don't want to have a, a his tag on your protein, you can simply put in a stop codon at the end of your gene, and then uh, continue on with your PCR primers encoding the his tag, but it won't won't ever be expressed if you want it not to be. So um, we have the vector with T7 or Ramnos promoters, but we found T7 promoter is generally rather leaky in cells. And uh, we really like the Ramnos promoter because it's, it's tunable and it can be used in either BL21s or traditional 10G type cells. So you can just use a single strain for cloning and protein expression. And the nice thing about Ramnos is that with, with, with Ramnos induction, each cell can be tuned for expression. So if you have a small amount of Ramnos, all the cells express a small amount of protein. In contrast with a T7 type system with the, with the LAC operators, generally what you see is that as you decrease the amount of, say, IPTT, IPTG induction, what you wind up with is a smaller fraction of cells that are expressing, but those cells are still expressing full on or completely off. So, so the, the T7 system gives you essentially an on-off response in a variable number of cells. So if it's a toxic protein, it, each cell that expresses it will be expressing a lot of it, and you will probably uh, kill that cell if it's toxic. Whereas with the Ramnos promoter, the, the dial works on a per cell basis. So this is a just again a, a schematic of the vector. And this is showing the, the tunability with Ramnos. So very low background in the absence of induction. Then as we increase Ramnos, you can see the, the protein expression going up. So, so a, a very nice tunable promoter here. And then um, this, this is again shows a, a variety of vectors we have. So it's taking a single PCR product, you can simultaneously clone it into seven different vectors that we provide that have seven different fusion tags. And these are, are for solubility. And each of the tags can be uh, easily snipped off. It's an a N-terminal tag. So you can um, just add your PCR product to each of the seven vectors. Um, we have them in individual tubes. And then simultaneously grow up and express all the clones and see which of the clone, which, which of the tags works to solubilize your protein. So it's, it's a real quick, easy way to screen for, for solubility. And, and here's an example, um, the GH1 protein growth hormone. So, so in this case, um, we have several tags that, you know, five of these demonstrated very good solubility. We can see these, these lanes in each set are total protein, soluble protein, and insoluble protein. So soluble protein is, is what, you, what you're looking for, and these are, these are circled here. And in each case, there's some fraction of insoluble protein. But you can see various tags work either better or worse to, to give you soluble protein. And the control is just a, a HIS-6 tag, which gives very little soluble protein, and most of it was insoluble. So, so this solubility suite, as we, we describe it, um, c contains all the different vectors and you just simply mix your same PCR product with each of them to, to screen. So finally, um, that, that's the, the end of the bacterial expression sy system that I, that I would like to talk about. And uh, I'd like to move on to mammalian cell expression. So we have um, a couple of vectors here that seem to, to work for most of what we'd like to do. The, the first is just a traditional circular vector. Um, we, we again, took away everything that's not essential to the vector, resulting in just a 3.4 KB backbone, CMV promoter driving your gene of interest, and a, a BGH poly A tail. Again, we have the vector set up to do the Expresso type cloning, so very quick, easy cloning into this vector. Um, we've used Expresso cloning to get inserts as big as oh, 5 or 6, 7 KB into this vector. Um, <clears throat> So, so again, it's, it's fast, easy cloning. You get expression in mammalian cells at a high level, 
And interestingly, the, uh, the CMV promoter we have also gives you expression in bacterial cells, which can, um, can, can be very convenient for you. So um, that, that's shown on the next page here. We just had um, a GFP as an example for expression in mammalian cells. Um, Cho or COS were the, the targets here. Um, very good expression off this promoter. And then using the same vector, um, we cloned a variety of inserts and then showed their expression in E. coli without any sort of induction. So um, RFIP, uh, a red fluorescence protein, a yellow fluorescent protein, or beta-gal, um, expressed very well in E. coli and similarly in mammalian cells. So for, for, for traditional or for, for not very difficult pro products, the, the, the regular PMA, PM, PME vector that I described works very well. But for difficult inserts, we decided to take that vector backbone and stick it into PJAS to give us um, a linear version of the vector so you could clone your insert into PJAS and get all the benefits of PJAS as well as mammalian expression. So we, we have just one version of this using canamycin as a selectable marker for bacteria, um, but the same gene also gives you uh, neomycin resistance in mammalian cells. So um, again, the idea was to, to to keep things as simple as possible. So this this vector also does have the, the chloramphenicol gene for bacterial selection, but not really needed. In any case, um, we found that this vector is very interesting, um, very useful for cloning uh, difficult inserts. We have a couple of those shown here. Um, this is work done by um, Al Zayadi, a collaborator of ours. And um, what what this group needed to do was clone four tandem subunits of a receptor into a single vector. And their purpose was to have um, have defined subunits as assembled into a single product. And each one of these subunits was 10 kilobases long. So the whole insert was 40 KB, just a single RNA um, transcribed to, to that length to give you a what could be a, a huge protein product. So they cloned either one, two, three, or four subunits into different um, preps of PJAS. And what they saw was that protein was produced even from the tetramer. So uh, this is a 1,000 kilodaltons, a megadalton protein expressed from these cells. And uh, the trimer, dimer, and monomer were expressed better, as you might expect. But importantly, this tetramer protein was functional um, in, a, in a binding assay. So, um, so this is one of the largest recombinant proteins ever produced, um, and that was done in the PJAS vector. And again, making a tetrameric um, repetitive DNA like this was just simply not possible in, in a, any other type of vector. And this, this vector, again, is available by custom quote only from Lucigen. It's not something that, that you'll see on our website or in our catalog. The same type of vector was used to clone multiple inserts as a mammalian operon. So in this case, we had uh, um, six genes lined up here with the viral P2A sequence between them. So again, this is a, a single promoter here, transcribes one long mRNA, and then as it is translated, these P2A sequences causes, cause breaks in the translation. So each little gene is popped off individually, or each little protein is, is popped off individually. You wind up with six independent proteins from a single RNA transcript. And we saw that they were all expressed. Um, the cells were selected on puromycin. And RFP, GFP, beta-gal were easily visible. Um, secreted ALK phosphatase was, was assayed and um, good expression there. So, so again, it's the, showing the, the utility of PJAS to, to create large inserts for, for expressing protein complexes. And again, Gibson cloning works very well to assemble things like this. So just a, a summary of these vectors. So for bacterial cloning and PSMART vectors seem to be good for almost all cases. And where they don't work, the PJAS vectors will will be able to. Um, 
essentially we, we haven't seen anything that can't be cloned. Probably the only exception to this was we, we once tried to clone several KBs of a poly G stretch and that didn't give us any inserts. But uh, that's most likely due to structural problems with the, the poly G. Um, the expresso vectors, um, those are for expression in bacterial cells, extremely convenient and easy to clone with all the benefits of PSMART. And PJAS expression vectors for mammalian or bacterial expression, um, again, available by custom quote. And on our website, we have a, uh, a vector selector guide where you can um, just uh, click different buttons to show the type of insert and vector that you're interested in, and it will go through our products and show you which one will do the job best for you. So finally, we have a, a little bit of time left over to talk about E. coli strains for typical DNA. And um, so we'd like to start off by asking, what, what do you use for this sort of thing? All right, I'm getting there. Hold on. And again, everybody, you can do um, answer, choose multiple strains that you use. Um, feel free to go for it uh, right now. <laughs> Oh, wow. So far, pretty much everybody's just using, oh, there we go. Now we're getting some folks. Standard strains, stables, NEB, sure, OK. If you haven't, we definitely recommend you try our Enduracell. The Enduracells are ours. Um, we strongly recommend you give them a, give them a go. Um, they work really well. We've got super high efficiency competent cells as well to help with all the transformation issues you might have. But um, wow, so it looks like everybody's just using sort of standard strains for everything and uh, probably running in some, into some issues. So hopefully we can help you um, with the vectors that Ron's talked about and then also um, some of the competent cells that we're going to talk about in a second as well, some of the specific strains. So um, thanks everybody for your feedback, interesting information, and um, take it away, Ron. Okay, and for those of you who are using other strains, um, you can feel free to contact Lucigen if you would like us to make those strains competent for you. Um, we have quite a few happy customers who, who, who like to do that. Um, and, and we'd also be interested in hearing what other strains you like to use. So if you, would, if you care to, uh, we, we'd be happy to have you uh, type that into the chat window and tell us what, you, what else you like to use. So, um, a couple of strains I would like to talk about here are the overexpress C41, C43 strains. These were derived from BL21, DE3, to express toxic or membrane proteins. And the strains were, were arrived at simply because um, so some people were trying to express some toxic proteins and they were killing all the cells, but a couple of resistant clones came out. And it turns out that these these clones were resistant to those toxic proteins simply because there was less fortuitous expression from the T7 promoter. So, so these strains actually have slightly reduced expression from the T7 promoter. So you have less leaky expression and a lower level of induced expression. And importantly, they're much more robust than trying to clone into a P-lyse strain. Um, I recommend people don't bother with P-lyse. Um, in my experience, um, the, these strains are very sick, and um, producing lysozyme is not something E. coli likes to do. So, so it's, a, it's a much better alternative to, to P-lyse. Um, the, the strains C41 or C43 show varying tolerance to, to different proteins, which is, is not uh, surprising. Every protein behaves differently. And we have these as chemically competent or electrocompetent. So just, just an example of, of what you see with these types of things. Um, so um, GFP is a very commonly used marker, of course. And we, we found that in BL21, we were getting rather small colonies. And they, they gave expression. And we had always been in content with the expression we saw with, it, with, with BL21. But we found that in C41, C43, even though they may not um, express at high of, as, 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 uh, at high of a level, um, we wound up eventually getting bigger colonies with better expression by turning the T7 promoter down. And similarly with a, with a red fluorescent protein, we saw that in BL21, um, 
expression was sporadic, variable. Some some colonies expressed, some didn't. But with the with the overexpressed strains, uh, again by by controlling expression a little bit better, you got better expression overall, which is kind of counterintuitive, but um, it, it is what we saw. And um, we have other uh, examples where um, a set of proteins, about 28 proteins, were, were tested here in C41, C43 compared to BL21. And um, what, what we saw was that in BL21, about 60% of the proteins were successfully transfer, transformed into the, into the cells. So, so the protein encoding genes, that is, were transformed into the cells. Upon expression, um, most of these were not expressed. So they, they were chosen to be rather difficult proteins. And, and indeed, they were. Most of the cells, you, you turn on induction, and the cells just stop growing. And uh, with, with C41, C43, um, we, we still saw viability was very good after induction. And then the, the amount of protein you expressed um, with BL21s, even though these cells were dying, they still managed to make some protein, which is uh, not, not unusual. And with the overexpress, we saw that they uh, still kept on growing and making protein. So over 350 publications have, have shown the utility of C41 and C43. And, uh, and very importantly, of all the membrane proteins that, are, that have been expressed in E. coli, um, half of those have been done in C41 and C43. So, so very popular strains for, for doing this sort of work. So, so those are ones we would recommend if you're, particularly if you have toxic or membrane proteins. And um, finally, we have the Endura cells. And these are very good for, 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 um, for inserts that have repetitive DNA in them. Again, the, the CRISPR gecko libraries, um, the, the, um, the, the group that, that describes this, the, the FANG group, they, they recommend using our Endura cells for making these lentiviral libraries. So they reduce unwanted recombination, get high yields, and again, they're available as electrocompetent or chemically competent and, and ready to go. So um, that, that about wraps it up. It looks like we're right on time here. And um, we will be here for a while longer. So if you have more questions, we're more than happy to, to take them and do our best to answer them. Thanks a lot for, for being here. Rob here again. So while we're waiting for uh, anybody to chat in some questions, if you have them, um, just to let you know, we've got another webinar coming up in a couple months. We haven't put out the official schedule yet, but it's likely going to be on um, uh, what's it going to be on? Oh, it's going to be on the transformation 101. So it'll be really looking at how to get maximal transformation efficiency and such like that. So. Um, we'll talk about that in quite a bit more detail in the next talk in about two months. So, uh, Ron, there was a question. Um, can the PGAS vectors be used with common E. coli strains? Yeah, good, good question. Um, actually, no, they can't be. Um, the vector depends on three phage genes that we've incorporated into a bacterial host. The host is derived from DH10b, but um, it would, the vector does depend on having three genes, a telomerase gene, some partitioning genes, and a, uh, an anti-terminator um, gene that, that increases the replication. So um, you, you do need to use the big, easy TSA host cells that we provide with the PGAS vector. Else have any other questions? Looks like everybody enjoyed it, so that's great. Well, we're very happy that you uh, took the time out of your day to listen to Ron. Um, he has some great, um, hopefully some great information in that webinar for you to help you uh, deal with your problematic uh, DNA. So uh, another question from Elizabeth. Um, how about expressive vectors? Special cells needed? No, for those, um, we've used these in um, just traditional DH10Bs or DH5-alphas would work fine. Um, we've had less success with with uh, BL21 type cells for Expresso. Um, so we, we recommend just, just using your, your standard lab strains for that. Um, a, another question I got here is, uh, what's the difference between C41 and C43? Um, they're basically just different 
mutations of the T7 promoter and, and expression of the proteins in there. So it's hard to tell which of these would be better for any particular protein. Generally, um, it's just a trial and error thing. Try both strains and see which one works better. And be, because of that, we, we do have kits. We, we do sell just uh, both cells together in sort of a, a mix kit. And um, can this, the, the overexpress C41, C43, can, can they be used with other systems, such as Gateway? Um, essentially, they can be used in any way that you would use BL21. So um, yeah, you, you, you could use them with other systems just fine. more folks typing in some either thanks or oh there we go another question um uh, a question about inclusion body formation um so, so generally with inclusion bodies they're they're caused by overexpression of your protein of interest so a couple of ways we attack that problem is first of all using a pram promoter vector so like our espresso vectors um, if you use those types of vectors, you can dial down the expression and um, basically start off expressing as low as possible to try to make smaller amounts of protein in larger cultures. And then also, um, I mentioned the, um, the Expresso series of vectors. We, we have a, a several solubility tags, uh, seven different solubility tags. And very often, uh, one of those tags in combination with the, the PRAM vector will be able to give you soluble protein from your from your insert. Um, as far as commercial research, um, so so the the vectors and cells are all provided with a license um, for academic research. So if you're using it as a nonprofit, um, you know feel free to go ahead and do whatever you like to do. If you're a commercial entity, um, we do license these vectors at quite reasonable terms. So um, yeah, please do talk to us if you need to use these sorts of things for commercial research. Um, but we ask that, uh, that you do, in fact, talk to us before you use them for commercial research. All right, well, it looks like we've got all our questions um, taken care of. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Ron, for an awesome webinar. And um, we hope to see you all in a couple months for the next uh, Lucigen webinar. Thanks and again. One, and, uh, oh, one last ahead, point before we go. Um, uh, feel free to, if you have any other questions that, that are not answered here, um, feel free to email us at, at tech support or give us a call. Happy to hear from you. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, everybody, and uh, have a great rest of your day.